Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The title of this message is simply, Don't Give Up. And primarily, I'm speaking to believers, those who have received Messiah Yeshua into their life, those who recognize the authority of Scripture, and those that, for the most part, they want to serve God. At least, they confess that. They state that. But all too often, the reality is this, that we are disobedient, that we rebel, that we're not so interested in serving God and obeying Him and hearing His revelation. Rather, we're more interested in telling God what we want Him to do for us, how we want Him to bless our purposes, and how we want to accomplish our own desires. And realize something, when we reject God's call, when we are interested in his revelation, what's going to happen? He is going to put us in a spiritual exile, which means this. We're not going to be where God wants us to be. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis and chapter 47. The book of Genesis chapter 47. Now, as I read the first half of this chapter, I was discouraged because here we have the children of Israel in Egypt. That's just not right. That is not what God told Avraham at the beginning, is it? Avraham was supposed to leave an exile, leave the land of, of Ur of the Chaldeans and to come to the land of Israel. But what happens? Well, what we find is this. We find that because of disobedience, and where does disobedience begin? Well, remember, Yosef had dreams. And the children of Jacob, Yosef's brothers, the patriarchs of each tribe, what did they do? They weren't interested in Joseph's dreams, meaning they weren't interested in God's revelation. In fact, they wanted to kill Joseph. In the end, they sold him into slavery, going down towards Egypt. And remember the principle. The measure that you measure with, what you give to others, it's going to be measured back to you. And now the children of Israel, they are in Egypt as well. And in a few short generations, they too are going to find themselves in bondage. And realize this exile is going to last for 430 years. Now, let's take things from Yaakov's perspective. He as well. When he heard about these dreams, he didn't respond as he should. And his failure to embrace them, he knew that there was something significant. He, he pondered them, he kept them. But the problem is, he didn't respond to them in enthusiasm. And therefore, there was no hindrance from the father to the brothers and they carried out their plan. They sold Joseph to slavery. And now Yaakov, his sons, and his grandchildren, all that is to him, we found out last week, all of this went down to Egypt. Now, someone might say, it's God's will. Well, it's God's permissive will. It's an outcome of God permitting individuals to sin. And they are not 
experiencing God's best. They are not in the midst of God's will. No, God wanted them to be in Israel. But because they chose sin, they were choosing exile. And God, he's faithful. He's not going to leave us nor forsake us. The scripture said emphatically last week, when God was speaking to Yaakov personally, he says, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will be with you, and I will bring you up. But this was not made about personally Yaakov's life. After saying, I will certainly bring you up, he says, but by the way, Yaakov, Yosef, your son, he is going to put his hand on your eyes, meaning, as we discuss, Yaakov, you're going to die there, and Yosef will come and close your eyes. Yaakov was not going to experience in his life this full restoration. No, he had strayed away far enough from God that he was not going to regain that place where God wanted him to be. But remember the title of this message, Don't Give Up. Let's be very candid and honest. Most believers, we have messed up. We have rebelled. We have disobeyed. We have not been passionate for the things of God. And realize what we're learning is simply this. There are consequences for such behavior. And because of that, Yaakov is not going to return alive. Yes, the children of Israel will bring up his, his body, his dead body, his bones. But Yaakov in his life is never going to see the promised land. And because of my disobedience, because of your disobedience, there's things that God had intended for us that we are not going to be the recipients of, but don't give up. Even though we may not have a full restoration of what God had planned for our life in this world, realize the emphasis should be on the kingdom, living out a kingdom character life and doing what God has called us to do where we find ourselves today. That is exactly what we're going to see in the life of Yaakov. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis and chapter 47. The book of Genesis and chapter 47. And as, as I read this chapter over and over, it was indeed discouraging until I came across what Yaakov did. And it's so simple, but it's profound. Never lose sight of that general call upon every believer's life. Be faithful to that, no matter where you find yourself. No matter how far your sin has taken you away from God's purposes, you can always begin to obey where you are. So verse 1, we find that, that the children of Israel, all their assets, every one of their household is now in Egypt. And we read in verse 1, chapter 47, verse 1, and Yosef came and told to Pharaoh, and he said, my father and my brothers and their flocks and their cattle and all which is to them, they have came from the land of Canaan. And behold them, they are in the land of Goshen. Now, Yosef has taken it upon himself to place his family in that location, Goshen. Now, why is this location of Goshen so important? Well, there's a physical reason and a spiritual reason. And usually, when we're living our life, decisions have those two factors. There's a physical purpose, and there's also a spiritual purpose, and we need to realize both. 
Because in reality, they come together. You see, they were taken to the land of Goshen because Yosef knew something. He knew that they were shepherds and cattlemen, ranchers. And ranchers want to live in a certain type of area, a certain type of land. And the land of Goshen was the best of the land of Egypt. It was perfect for being shepherds, being cattlemen, establishing their ranch. So Joseph placed his family in this location. That's the physical reason. But did you ever ask yourself, what does this word Goshen mean? Because all words, names in Hebrew have significance. They have a message. And the land of Goshen comes from the Hebrew word legeshet, which means to approach. And here's what we find. God has the people being placed in the land of Goshen because everything, I mean everything, that Joseph did, he did it out of obedience to God. He submitted continuously. Every decision he made was based upon the revelation of God. And God placed Israel spiritually in Eretz, Goshen, the land of Goshen, because they needed to learn how to draw near, how to approach God. Because restoration begins with just that, us drawing near to God, us approaching Him in a proper way. And realize if you're going to experience restoration to whatever degree that's possible in this body, in this age, in this life, you need to learn how to approach God properly. And that is the purpose of this exile. So they are in the land of Goshen. Look now, if you would, to verse 2. He did something here. We read, Umikse echav. Now, Mixay is the end, the end of his brothers. Now, you look among the commentators, and you will find several explanations of what that means. The end of his brothers, probably the youngest ones. Some scholars say that it's not speaking about his literal brothers, those 11 brothers that Yosef had, but among his brethren he brought the least of those who were in his family before Pharaoh. And there's different explanations of why he did so. And notice the number. This gives us also help in interpreting this properly. Look again at verse 2. And the end of his brethren, he took five men. Why five? Five is the number of incompletion, that which is lacking. So he didn't take the strongest, those that were of the best uh, uh, presentation, but he took the least, the least of his brethren and stood them before Pharaoh. And notice the outcome of this. Keep reading. We read. From the least of his brethren, he took five men and he brought them before Pharaoh. He, he caused them to be before Pharaoh. Verse 3. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, what are your deeds? Now, most Bibles in English will say, what is your profession? But it's a word, ma'asechem. Ma'asechem, ma'aseh. Deed, ma'asim, deeds, ma'asechem, your deeds. Now, there's much significant in that phrase. What are your deeds? Now, they didn't respond in the fullness of what they have done, but rather they simply took it in the general sense. It's, and they say to Pharaoh, shepherd are your servants. Now, it's in the singular. We see here, ro'e tzon. 
with the hey at the end tells us individually they want to say, I am a shepherd. Both we and our fathers, meaning historically, we're just shepherds. We are keepers of cattle. We are ranchers is what they're saying. And they said to Pharaoh, to sojourn in the land we have come because there is no pasture for the flock which is to your servants. For heavy is the famine in the land of Canaan. And now dwell your servants in the land of Goshen. So they're revealing to him what he already knows. That Joseph's family have come. They are in the land of Goshen. And what he has told them over and over. And that is they're shepherds. They're cattlemen. And that's why they have come to the land for no other purpose. The famine has driven them there. But the famine is a consequence of their sin. Look now to, to verse, verse 5. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, saying, Your father and your brothers, they have come unto you. Verse 6. The land of Egypt, it is before you. Meaning all that's here is available to you. But the best of the land, settle your father and your brothers, for they shall dwell in the land of Goshen. So they're already there, and what we find is Pharaoh agreeing with Yosef. Now, this is important because agreeing with God's revelation. And what does that bring about? Well, it brings about a, a position change whereby you are now ready to receive blessings. Now, when we continue to read, we find a peculiar verse. Look, if you would, to the second half of verse 6. We read here, Fe'im yadata fe'yesh bam an she'chayil. He says, And if you should know that there is among them an she'chayil. Now, there's two ways that we can take it. This phrase, Anshe Chayil. Chayil, that is uh, a word of power. Those same letters can be used in speaking about a mighty army. But normally, this phrase is used in regard to not physical power alone, but moral decency. For example, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 10, we have the phrase, Eshet Chayel, which is a woman of value. And so many times, this word is used to speak about the, the best quality of an individual. So Pharaoh's asking, among them, among your, your brothers, do you have any Anshe Chayel, any men of great integrity and with that integrity comes power and authority together so he's asking this and why do you think that is well because he realized something he understands the insufficiency of his people among the egyptians there are not people with such integrity so he sees the least of these brothers and he says, among them, can you recommend anyone who has integrity, value, individuals? And what do you want them for? Well, notice what the scripture says. That you shall put them, very important, that you shall put them as sare mikne, that is leaders or officials, over, he says, the flock which is to me. And we read here, the word that he uses, mikne, would be more of my cattle. Now, something stands out to me as I read this. 
Because if you look at the end of chapter 46, you will find that cattlemen and shepherds, that type of behavior, job, it is an abomination to the Egyptians. Not just something that they didn't do, something that was beneath them. They use the phrase, to'eva, an abomination to the Egyptians. But nevertheless, Pharaoh, he had cattle. And he wanted men of integrity, men of authority, men that could be a blessing to watch over his, his livestock. And notice what we find in verse 7. Now, verse 7 is related to, to verse 6. We need to always understand how the scripture works together. What, what we find is this. Paro agreed with Yosef. Yosef did everything under submissiveness to God's revelation. So because Pharaoh agreed with Yosef, he was agreeing with the purposes of God, God's plan. And when we do that, we can expect blessing. And therefore, no sooner does he agree, does he say, you know, is there any men of value among your brethren that you can put as officials, leaders over my, my cattle? And what he means here about all the cattle that he has, his possessions. And immediately after that, look at verse 7. Ve'yave Yosef et Yaakov Aviv. What it says here, and Joseph brought Yaakov his father, and he stood him before Pharaoh. And what we find is, he was asking, is there anyone among your brethren, your family, that is a man of value, those that I can use? And immediately, what did Yosef do? He came and brought his father and stood his father before Pharaoh. And what did Yaakov do? Look at the end of verse 7. We read, Vavarech Yaakov et Paro. And Yaakov blessed Pharaoh. Now, what do we see here? We see not just a response to Pharaoh's request, but we see Yaakov being Israel. What do I mean by that? We see this man, Yaakov, doing what God has called his covenant people to do, and that is to be a blessing, to bless the world. So Yaakov, he finds himself in exile. He finds himself not going to be restored back to the land. He doesn't complain. He doesn't fall into despair and dis discouragement. He doesn't blame other people. What does he do? He continues on. He doesn't give up. Remember the title of this message. He doesn't give up. What does he do? He blesses Pharaoh. That is, he begins this process of restoration, becoming the person that God has called him to be. So Yaakov blesses Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says to him, look if you would to verse 8, and Pharaoh says to Yaakov, how many days of years is your life? How old are you? But he says, how many days of years is your life? Now, that is a Hebrew idiom that has great significance. See, lots of times we think about our life in such a broad or general way. But we need to realize that our life consists of years. But each year consists of days. You say, well, that's not pro profound. Everyone knows that. Here's the problem. We don't live like that. We don't understand that our life is a sum total of years, and those years reflect days. What did we do this day? What did we do yesterday and the day before that? And what will we do tomorrow? Our life is made up of days each day turns into a year and notice what Yaakov says and the information here is significant 
Once again, verse 8. And Pharaoh said to Yaakov, How many days of years is your life? And Yaakov said to Pharaoh, The days and years of my sojourning is 30 and 100. So, 130 years. And he says, Me'at ve'ra'im. Me'at is small. It's, it's probably the word, in this case, insignificant. And he says, also, ra'im, meaning evil, and it's in the plural. Now, when he says evil, he's not talking about just gross wickedness. He's using the word ra in its proper sense, which means outside of God's will, against the purposes of God. And what we read here and what we should learn as we translate it properly is this. He's saying, I have lived 130 years. And up until now, my life has been rather insignificant. In fact, it has been full of those things which are against the will of God. Realize that. Here he is. 130 years. And he's saying, as I reflect upon my life, I've lived an insignificant life compared to what God wanted to do. And the reason for that is I have repeatedly missed out on God's will. Compared to, notice what he says, me'at ve'ra'im have been the days of, of years of my life and I have not obtained the days and the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojournings meaning this we all came with a purpose we came to this land meaning the land of Canaan with a call upon us and compared to my father and grandfather Yitzchak and Avraham my life has not obtained what their life has. When I look at their sojournings and mine, they made it to the land and they died in the land and they passed their heritage on to the next generation. But my life is pale in comparison because I am here outside the land of Israel. Look now to verse verse. But nevertheless, in spite of that, he doesn't give up. What does he do? This is the second time, and the second time it's written, it's to show significance, to emphasize. And Yaakov blessed Pharaoh, and he went out from before Pharaoh. Very significant. He blessed him, and he went out. And it's to highlight what Yaakov did. He blessed another. Here is he from the family, the lineage of, of the Jewish people. And he's blessing a Gentile. That's Israel's call. Yaakov, he may be far from the land of promise, but he's still obeying now the purposes of God in order that there might be restoration, not in his life, not even in the life of his children, but in those next generations, in those generations that are coming, that they might experience that full restoration. And he's laying the foundation of it now, today, in his life. And that is such wise counsel for you and me. Now, you may be an elderly man or woman that's listening to, to this study, Realize, even if you are so close to death, if you are able, bless someone. Give them the gospel. Share with them the message that you have learned over your life. And that is, don't live an insignificant life. Don't live in disobedience to the will of God. Even if you just have one more opportunity to serve God, do it. Begin that recovery, that restoration 
whereby you are approaching God. What you fall short of in this life, you, by God's grace, will experience in the kingdom of God. Don't give up. Don't live in discouragement. Don't live in despair. Be the blessing. That's what Yaakov did. Look now to verse 11. And Yosef, he, he settled his father and his brothers and gave to them Ahuzah. Ahuzah is a possession. Now, it can literally be translated in modern Hebrew, it is an estate. It's a compound. It's a mansion. So in this case, we could see it as a large ranch in the land of Goshen. But literally, the word comes from possessing. So Yosef, he, he caused his father and his brothers to settle. And he gave to them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, just as Pharaoh commanded. So the city of Ramses, well, it was where? In the land of Goshen. And furthermore, look if you would to verse 12. And Yosef supported his father and his brothers and all the house of his fathers with what? With bread, according to the children. Meaning this, bread, and notice the words that are used here. The word for sustaining. So he sustained his family and he gave them bread. Bread to not the fathers or the sons, but it uses the word for children, small children. Now, did he give bread to all of his family? Obviously he did. But the emphasis here was upon the tough, the littlest of the children. Meaning this, Joseph, he led this family and he gave a priority, a preference to that next, that new generation. And it simply foreshadows what God tells faithful people to do. And that is to teach their children diligently the word of God. Understand that the term lechem, bread, can mean physical bread, physical sustenance, but also bread is a very spiritual word. It speaks about a spiritual provision. And that's what Yosef did. He, he called his family to understand their spiritual call. This is what he was about. But the question is, are the children of Israel, his brothers and those next generations, are they going to be faithful to that call? Are they going to be faithful to the demonstration, that example that Jacob gave when he blessed Pharaoh? Or are they going to fall away not focusing upon their call, not focusing upon restoration, not putting an emphasis upon approaching God once again in faith and obedience. Well, that's what we're going to discover as we press on further on into the book of Genesis next week when we conclude chapter 47. So until then, may God richly bless you. Don't give up. Be faithful in the little things and you will find that you will have great influence in those around you. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, 
as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.